And now, Arthur Osborne's True Tales to the Supernatural. We begin today with the tale of the Trolling Bag. I happen to be upon a trip to Cologne, Germany, in order to give a talk on a conference on Karst Artifact. It was there I encountered a fellow archaeologist who regaled me with a tale over some of their local brew. It so happened that he happened to have a dearly good reason for insisting upon a vote, though I did not know it then, having no such requirement to indulge in the local fair, to exchange wonders of words and experiences with the assembled colleagues who gathered around him to hear of the happenings he encountered here in this very same city, the tale of the trolling bag. There once was his friend who became his client, who he encountered, and seemingly perplexed and told him thus. His great-uncle died, having been a grand master craftsman of many kinds, his deeds fixing a plethora of esoteric mechanisms and simple and complex jobs alike, boys of some renown, and those that I know would come to make special visitation to him with objects that fell into disrepair, which few others could fix. He knew he was about to pass, and he felt heavy the responsibility of ensuring that his clients would have someone to visit after his time had ended. Therefore, he thought not of anybody but his great nephew, a craftsman, but not of any legendary renown, and sat him down over points and pretzels to explain not just the powers he was about to inherit, but his new responsibilities as the bequeathed new owner of the trolling bag, the clandestine legendary secret of his success, and his father's before him. He confided that the trolling bag could work wondrous, but if only if tended to was kind stewardship. The tools of the trade in their antiquated purest forms could be found within the trolling bag, but also its manifest true owners, the trolls themselves. When young Hans heard this from Hans the Elder, he thought initially that they had both had too many points and near both fell off his chair. How could it be that some amount of master craftsman trolls could be living in his great uncle's trolling bag like the miniature brownies of old? It did not seem feasible, but Hans the Elder insisted, and further with a stern admonishment that when taken into Hans the Younger's possession and into his workshop, that he should ensure to it it should receive its due, a pint of longer and a bowl full of pretzels each Sunday, and he would find his work come out right as rain throughout his work week. Though he warned them to leave not but the finest work for the back, at least initially, to ease the transition between Hans's. Turned out that he, after he took possession of the bag, Hans the Elder took a bit more of a retirement than he anticipated, and many happy returns came to him upon stepping away from his work and his practice. He was more than glad to refer them to the new possessor of the trolling bag, and Hans the Younger's business thrived because of all the clients that could go no elsewhere on account of their delicate and esoteric work they often depended upon to keep their own affairs in order. Upon initiative, Hans the Younger's spirit rose with gratitude and gladness, for he had only to leave a point foaming with crisp bowls of pretzels out each Sunday, and that was the extent of his participation. With how well the esoteric work paid, he hardly needed to keep most of his less appreciative everyday clients and focus more on the work he loved and the work that paid the best. With his extra time to focus on pageant projects, he devoted himself to arcane techniques of his own, and leaving the finishing touches of the trolling bag in time produced marvels even Hans the Elder had to take respectful appraisal of, though then with that he knew his time was to pass, and with the trolling bag in good hands, and so with that relief he died. Things changed, however, when the details of his work did as well. Though we had found a fine partnership with the trolling bag, it appeared that the circumstances conspired against him, so that he was injured into a comb, and so he could not contribute the beer and the pretzels as required of the trolling bag. Instead, the bag fell into the hands of his own nephews. In short order, they didn't remember his great uncle's admonishments and left the bag without its due. The brothers were mechanics who ran their own auto body shop and who took the old tool bag with them as their uncle and great uncles before swore by it, and they thought to keep it as a lucky charm in their own place of craftsmanship. With the trolling bag in its new home on the wares, without due tribute each Sunday, it was clear only to us listening to the tale that trouble was right around the corner. It came to pass that there were troubles without number in the body shop of the two troubled nephews, and it was indeed two brothers against an antagonistic de trolling bag. Only after some considerable trouble and consternation did Hans the Younger awake from his coma, and when he found what his de bag had done off to, set out to rectify the trouble straight away. 
Thank goodness young Alan found his way to the body shop that day, or others might have paid the price. He admonished his foolish nephews for having not listened to him and giving the trolling bag its due. It's weakly point and frittles, and they would back siphon a shite, or once they was made faces were in need of slapping. Upon their mockery of this strange uncle woke up from his coma, he set to settling things right, and proving his point with a pint in the same stroke, he wagered with for the course of a pint a day, instead of a pint a week, that he should see each issue in their shop abated, and in yet it instead see their work done in a flash over the next week. Backed up with problems that seemed to multiply and complexify day upon day, they relented to his wager, seeming to delight pre-negotiating neither brother would take their free points on either in eighteen days. Hans the younger told two brothers to leave their shop for a week and come back afterwards to see their troubles put to rest. Young Hans knew the trolling bag had been kept without for too long and so neglected in an unappreciated estate. It would already be good enough for causing trouble. Though the foolhardy brothers of the body shop still look upon that time with consternation, the children bag could have said to have been merciful, often doing things that would annoy instead of to harm their unsuspecting customers. Instead of treat, de treating the trolling bag like an enemy, he instead greeted it and treated it like an old friend. He openly took it out for points at the very pub that is, and he said that you will find old pensioners in the musty corners of this establishment who will swear on your honour that they saw the little gremlins scrambling to the edge of the bowl, cups and glasses to sup upon the brew that they had known for generations. Not to placate, but to celebrate them, he ordered everything on the menu, which drew mirth from the waitstaff, but curiosity when each plate seemed to have been clean. Only one man at feast was set before, and he did not seem overly full after, though he must have had all the legs they saw, as he was drinking pints two at a time with his clever little fellows, who did him the kindness of forgiving him his absence, for he recounted to them the wherefores of his absence, and in turn they agreed with him to teach the insipid brothers a lesson or two, before fixing their troubles and winning the bet they would keep them in longer till the end of their days. Not only after the week was up did Hans the Younger cavort and party hard with the trolling bag and the body shop of the irksome louts as the trolls that the bag dubbed them, but they fixed every problem and dent them in the full garage, full transmissions, engines, chassis work, and every tricky bit was done to the highest standard, beyond reproach in an early pace, so that they had time for their master stroke. It stood before them, an old Carmen Gia with a chassis wore down to its pewter, which the lackadaisical brothers had never got it around to restoring, but had kept around in the hopes of doing so, when he knew he would further prank his nephews and win the day. Before setting inside the body shop with young Hans on the next Sunday from the bet was made, the two brothers had not set shoot in the shop for the last week aforementioned specified in the bet, and they were gloating, for they were sure that however talented Hans the Younger had become in his craftsmanship, arcane and esoteric, there could have been little chance that they had been beating their wager, as even half the repairs in the full garage would have taken them weeks even together. We want the premium longer, old man Hans, we will call you, as they chuckled, but Hans the Younger had yet another wager for them. Double or nothing in exchange for the Carmen Gia in their garage. As the car was in shambles down to its pewter and its bodywork, they gladly agreed, looking forward to their complimentary daily points as they opened the door to their workshop. Not only was everything in tip-top shape, but it seemed to their bewilderment that the structure of the body shop had been inverted and lay out. Left was right in the same such otherwise as the brothers looked almost horrified as it dawned on them how this would undermine their workflows. Amusement swept across the face of younger horns as the trolling bag was well positioned to get a good view of their anguish, for if they knew the trolling bag was able to produce such an obvious feat of magic such as they were witnesses to, if the bodywork on the cars was flawless, it was a given. When the the tarp thrown over the Carmen gear was the pace of resistance, so thrown as he cast the cloth aside into the back seat, it could be shown that the vehicle had been transformed. Not only did the condition of the vehicle have been renewed in every way better than the original fashion, the chassis had been lovingly buffed, down and engraved with the theme of hops, playing across its pewter with a playful elegance. 
as he placed the trolling bag lovingly into his new vehicle, Hans the Younger just smiled and thanked him not only for his new carman, but for paying for his and his best boy's daily points as he sped out of their garage, leaving them to stumble confusedly as the residents of the trolling bag had tied their laces together. This conclusion to the tale of the trolling bag had the assembles in fits of drunken yet doubtful laughter. In sympathy for the brothers, but not too much so. For Hans the Younger eventually requested to them, they having had to learn a lesson every day for some time in their new inverted garage. Being that the trolling bag paid for itself in terms of labour for wages, the two brothers were glad to pay for their points to this day, and even after Hans the Younger retired and bequeathed the trolling bag to him, wherein they were delighted to keep the trolling bag in fine fare, for they thought it best to keep the descendants of the trolling bag finishing touches, the masterworks of vintage car restoration, and they fell into their body shop instead becoming a carriage trade showcase of distinctive inclination. And that is not the only tale we can tell in this very Pope, said my compatriot, Dater Mosebrook, a local who is in Cologne more than some of the time, but especially here for this conference. I had enjoyed his tale as he trolled back and wanted to hear more. Between giving lectures here at the conference, I was supposed to be here for three days. I wanted to make good use of my evenings. Winding down with tales such as this seemed to be a great use of my time. And besides the beer, this tale had the ring of truth upon it, however phenomenal from an objective perception. I could tell Cologne possessed many secrets, and was possessed by them very same. A few curious objects brought me to the links of my lectures, and even more curios and delights and woes were set before and ahead of me. It seemed many haunted things were here around me, with so little time to investigate. I wanted to make every minute count. I knew as I went home to bed with a gentle, worn glowing that tomorrow would bring other weird tales we'd look back on with a smile, wandering over them for some time to come. And that concludes the tale to Trolling Back. We're going to do all three tales today, hopefully, and we'll do others. And if you like this content, tell your friends. Yeah, tune in for more, but we continue on with now. The Tale of the Spirited Tea. It was a fine morning for my second day of the conference. I was lecturing on cursed antiques, when afterwards, Emilio Campo Verde, a Brazilian researcher who was there last evening upon a telling of Dieter's tale, approached me after my lecture. The second day, it seemed he was inspired by the theme of my lectures on objects that were possessed, and to share with me of the brook of the poo air tea he had retained after he claimed he had removed the curse binding it for a client. Afterwards, he had retained the brick of tea as a memento. Upon inquiring how he could prove that the tea had been possessed, and how he removed the tea from the spirits possessing it, he replied that the tale was best told over points, with all of us gathered to hear the wherefores in the house. So intrigued, we were heading into the evening meeting at Old Gidden House Pub, with my interest pleased. The crew arrived directly after the conference officially ended for the day, and with auctions on day three. I was officially interested in Emilio's technique for driving the spirits from his tea brick, so that I might try my hand at clearing some potentially lucrative objects I might win at bidding the next day. We settled in, nursing our brews, as Mr. Campo Verde began telling his tale as he recalled it. Notably, the first contact he had with the client in question was in his native Brazil. He sought help clearing the brick of tea, but before so he tried methods, various, for ridding himself of the tea, notably selling, gifting, or even attempting to throw away the cursed brick. Pressed and wrapped in ornamental fashion, the tea always found its way back to him. So exasperated was he that he went to a that he found the Chinaman, who was known for its interest in the area. An enthusiasm for tea, running a simple tea house. There he attempted to convince the man to open the tea to try some, hoping that unbeknownst to him, he should consume and offer it to his customers, perhaps. Before them both lay the tea in a bar, and upon very careful examination of the tea, in its wrappings he proclaimed the tea possessed by an oni. Not only could the tea not be consumed without absorbing the spirit, but in order to be rid of the, the brick and the spirit itself, 
the brick of poor air needed to be purified, allowing the spirit to be cleansed and liberated. This was news to Emilio's client, and even as his profession was to him, until the tea house owner directed him to consult with him for further details. It was there discussion began regarding the process went down. Many in the assembled crowd dearly wished to hear Emilio's technique. Though through careful listening, they might refine and elaborate on their own craft. He tried several traditional methods, but it perplexed him as much as his client with a brick of Chinese tea to contain a Japanese oni. Based on the binding to this gentleman in possession of the tea, his client, he assumed, had some connection to the acquisition of his tea. However, it was the case that he had found the tea brick in an old bookstore and at a great price. It was thrift that led him to make the purchase, as tea is typically expensive, and he liked often to try new things. How better to do so than with an exotic brick of tea at a great price? The tea looked too good to open, neatly wrapped in ominous ornamental black paper with gilt edged embossing. It looked rather luxurious, an oddly poisonous foreboding in its wrapping. It promised more in its steady state as an art object. At first he was charmed to keep it as a paperweight. In time his fascination towards the tea brick grew, and it seemed increasingly as if the tea had brought misfortune into his life from when he first encountered it. Grimly sitting on his table, it seemed as if it was weighing on his very chest. Its possession was oppressive to his presence, and he felt he needed to rid it of him. Not only by drinking it, it seemed once too good and too bad somehow to drink. And after the initial aforementioned attempt to be rid of it, the man encountered and encumbered by this sinister tea knew what he had to do. Working with Emilio, he followed up on research, and it came to pass that Mr. Campo Verde theorized a new strategy to purify, cleanse, or liberate the tea from its dread legacy. He imagined it might be possible to turn the tea brick into a talisman, and in so doing, the ill destiny of the tea brick might be averted. It was fortunate that Emilio was an enthusiast in Asian supernatural culture. Having a blessed bill from the oil in question, and blessed candles from the local chaplain, he began chanting a purification ritual, and integrated his own power incantation into the traditional chant. And as his power incantation began to thrum around the room, the candles burst open with fierce winds. And though the candles surrounding the tea did not flicker or dampen with the additional winds, the circle was silent, and yet crackled with energy. Something was unfolding, and it seemed to be the paper wrapper surrounding the tea brick. When lifted off, the tea brick looked rich and oily, dark, dense, and moist as the day it was pressed. In an instant and in a flash, the windows snapped shut, and as if the world snapped back into focus after its purification trance. The wrapper was back on the tea, but it had changed. No sign of the original folds in the paper was present, and instead the paper was molded into an entirely new shape. It was obvious that the tea brick had changed, and for the better. It no longer had the benevolent energy emitting from it. Though the tea still retained some ominous purport, it was obviously not the threat that it was before the ceremony. Bringing glad news to the client, he was just glad to be rid of the cursed object, and paid Emilio handsomely in comparison to his portion of effort, and bade him keep the tea, so he could put the matter of the demons of the tea behind him. The gather assembled were experts and enthusiastic about supernatural encounters, and some among them maintained their scepticism regarding whether or not the tea was even really cursed in the first place. Amelia was prepared for this circumstance and requested a modestly sized pitcher of boiling water from the wait staff at the pub. And they overhearing the conversation somewhat, they were equally curious as the listeners, and so provided that steaming pitcher straight away. Into the boiling pitcher the tea brick went, and immediately rich golden tea emerged from the brick. You can tell its potency, and all surrounding the scene were amazed. Emilio should be so wasteful with a brick of tea that could provide many dozens of cups should be used for one such boiling pitcher of tea. Not only that, the wrapping was so lovely. Cups of tea were poured for all those surrounding, and when the last drop had been poured from the pitcher, all one could see, as if the tea brick had never been touched protected by the technique of being turned into an amulet, and yet able to produce such rich cups of tea nonetheless without obvious diminishment. The fellowship of supernatural enthusiasts were understandably wearing regarding the nature of the tea so produced, and therefore careful regarding even sipping the tea. But even those who just inhaled the aroma found it to be focused in their estimation. 
Those who chose to drink the tea with Amelia were transported to a scene of old. A lady of some esteem was weighing down her undergarments with stone. She was dressed finely and went to meet an officer who was making a gift to her of tea and consolation for her husband's unwarranted execution. The lady, knowing the officer was to blame and seeking revenge, led him to a nearby deep well, where she embraced him and did plunge down into the well with him, pulling him down to his watery grave. The brick of tea sat on the edge of the well until some youth happening by picked it up and traded it for a good bit of candy to a nearby merchant. Then the tea brick went through a series of misfortunes, made its way to the bookstore, where Emilio's unfortunate client purchased it. Those who chose to drink the tea would never forget why the tea was cursed, nor the haunting flavors and aromas they witnessed. Him still more drank of the tea that evening, and those that did, myself among them, found it difficult to discount the legacy of that spirited brew. And to doubt the purification the tea underwent, and afterwards, no harm befell him from that encounter anyway. And you could tell the lady of the tea had been satisfied with how Emilio told her tale. As for me, I was glad to witness a redemptive journey which spanned the decades leading up to some very fine cups of tea. The final day of the conference was tomorrow. And I knew the auction hand held secrets to uncover, and always I was open and eager to explore them to the fullest extent permitted. And that concludes the spirited tea, the second tale of Arthur Osborne's true tales of the supernatural. And now, and if you like this content, like, share, or subscribe, tell your friends. We wanted to spread to like-minded individuals that like these types of tales. We're going to do this third tale short. And now, without further ado, the third tale of Arthur Osborne's true tales of his supernatural ye old Fortran server haunt. There is a man, unusual in nature, very unlikely of a man, one to whom much was given, given freely by many, for the joy of his witness. But a light shining in his eyes he never had to take. He is the recoverer of lost items, and upon the third day of the conference, we find him finishing his lecture on the origin and nature of cursed and blessed objects. This, of course, happened decades ago, and our author is describing the story from the vantage point of a cursed objects auction at a conference on cursed objects, and will be a lecturer. Yours truly, that he gives lecture on the difference between cursed objects and blessed objects. The key distinction he found was that with objects that were blessed so, they were because they were left behind willingly, and cursed objects were cursed so, because they were left behind against wretched objection. Underneath the eye of the author there lay a scar, faded with time and age, a cat he once knew struck him across underneath his eye, a cat Chico had been his mother's dear and baby boy. So he reducibly replaced, gazing into the eyes of his usurper, he thought to mark him and to remind him that in that moment of vulnerability he could have taken his sight. Such a boy would never forget the lines etched across his face are few, but for each one hung a provenance. Provenance hung heavy in the air of the conference hall. Those assembled paired to Berlus with gimlet eye, poring over those objects they may never see again. The most legendary of which sat in the key position, surrounded by others of equal, although less visibly obviously ominous portent. A grisly tale, dripping with the blood of the lost. A knotty root, ergonomically discovered, crafted, and etched with chilling precision, something not considered possible along the time of its craftsmanship. Patina of dozen mage, centuries past. Centur the centre of it is grotesquely disfigured, etched across the face of a magnificent tree root, a pioneer man who laid down the, the last of the Indian war chiefs, who stood against them on contested land, hard fought. That magnificent red man with full feather headdress, painted in red relief background, severely whittled firmly by those who would never forget the face of the man who which from which he stole his dear cloak. Those of those of future centuries may consider it gauche, a defilement, a desecration, which it was, of a sacred war cloak, which gave life from one end and took it away from the other. 
But for the pioneer's man who took the life of the last chief, he was driven, haunted to commemorate the face of the man whose life he took to take his grim prize, the haunted and dread might of one of the last war chiefs of the nation. These and the flags of the two sides of the same family, each with 47 stars, drenched in the blood sacrifice of countless suffering, which rendered them in the hands of injustice, deft in misfortune, and embroidered with love and with pride, each colour matched and fresh as the day they were sown, of similar but not identical diameter, they never flew, but were displayed in the family room, when there was a family room to have. Time after time, such objects find their way for sale, for rates alarmingly tempting to the educated and lay enthusiast. Victorian flow blue china teacups with saucers, six in perfect condition, the prized possession of aristocracy at the height of imperial power, found their way from one misfortune to another. No one can deny the divergence from other teacups so accumulated, for some were put into glad hands, delicate rose-painted cups, lost relics of utmost sophistication and artistry. For the last of the flaxen in an ivory and gold brocade, still held in the ribbon of its makers, the last of from whom it was possible to spin straw into gold. For centuries these wonders accumulated, and many more were in the hands of a kindly family of stewards, but for misfortune alone were separated and dispersed. Fortunes found and lost can be recovered, and from the most legendary of discoveries the foundations of new achievements can be wrought. For those dear treasures, and from whom they were lest, and for both, in the presence of so blessed and cursed, wept, for if they wept openly, it were rarer than in uncomposed private moments after, but in often cases, wept over in remembrance, most often by those who received them. Our bones from the Eskimo, and the tattered papoose, the smats of Bugsy Malone, crisp was the day they were made, an old banking bench, and they reinforced by gold along the breaking point. Depression era stemware and English stoneware, hand mills silverware, the emblem of roses playing across the scutcheon with each fork, a complement of full metal time, like full metal tang knives of French and Italian origin, and an auto harp in a colourful shag case, some blossom warm tone and lacquer and then sound, all items hard earned, bitterly fought to keep. But for all these wonders still yet, and for their journey full and broad and diverse as it will be, our tale tonight revolves around a ramship and in the soul residing. A gentleman graveyard was Gideon Goolsby, someone who worked on an old legacy mainframe for his entire career, and a building no one really knows about, and a corporate heart hidden away. He had a passion for the traditional style, and the position offered to him was one where he had an opportunity to serve with magnificence and grace, and serve well he did, for as long as he was allowed. Who was it was being served was questioned later. Intermittently, yes, and Henri Henri was glad to see the machineries running appropriately and to acquire function. The mysterious Henri Henri, dressed in Seville Row suits, unstructured charcoal herringbone was his preference. And no one knows who or why, or even sometimes when there was even a need. It was questioned, but it was always appreciated. Henry would cry, Goosby, where's my papitas in Sultanas? Meaning about the provincial hamlet of a town he grew up in, Mr. Goosby had an earnest, quiet dignity. And Mr. Henry was a relative newcomer to the area. He had a curious disposition and maintained an intrigue as to the reason for the mysterious Mr. Goolsby, as he kept an eye on things in the community from his high office three floors above the main street of the community. He wondered over Goolsby's origins and his aims as Gideon merely lived his life. He knew that he had to work with him to understand him, though he invited him in for an interview. Affably, eloquently, decisively, the decision was bound to be Goolsby's. At first, in Goolsby's new life, he found little function required of the facility's potentialities. But in his office, having his tasks to run, and having anticipated for the good maintenance of the systems in question, he found he had time to peruse the substantially large and growing library and take the facility maintained and expanded Goolsby's repertoire to the point by which he became formidable in the art of establishing new methods for accomplishing novel structure. After Gideon had settled in and become accustomed to his obligations, he surmised that further assistance was required. Some of their work was disturbingly, perplexingly tricky, and he needed someone who was absolutely raised to solve the problems no one else could.
Really, the only thing that was possible was to go overseas, because those people were more obsessed with knowing the specifics inside and out. And of these people, it was serendipity to be allowed Pushyami to be his choice. But serendipity was not exactly the watchword of Pushyami's childhood. Or you could probably say that it was. From an early age, she was toddling around and stumbled across her father's electrical engineering books and diagrams. She expressed an aptitude for unusually complicated things, and inexplicably enough, her parents encouraged her. To the point where, before school, she had drafted her first hardware schematics under the guidance of her father, and was known for punching above in her weight class of her academic career. Takes her to be distinguished among so many people. Because of her parents' support and encouragement of her brilliance, it put her ahead. Little did she know it was an unusual choice to come to a new land, it would put her on a new path for unbelievable adventure. Broadening his own growth and humbly encouraging himself and his partner protege, the incomparable Pushyami Gogoreddy, the very same Pushyami who, from an early age, had an aptitude and superlative inclination towards computers and technology in its familiar and novel forms. As those forms were diverging, joining in compelling new ways, each method of data preservation, concatenation, transmission, and concordance that Gideon humbly confided and celebrated, that Pushyami's zeal for investigation and understanding of principal mechanics and methods, her persistence in the face of near incomprehensibility, was all inspiring as was his. As they worked together, they felt a camaraderie. And as the weeks turned to months, and the months turned to years, and the years turned to decades of gradual improvement for their loyalty, they were rewarded only somewhat, but enough to remember fondly. And the environs were so rarefied, so secluded, delightfully ensconced, tastefully in nature, where the squirrels were known to cavort in frolic. The most peculiar thing about the whole facility Pushyami was known to come on to her chagrin, waiting for the automatic toilets. We flush back on you all the time, such that she posed a ditty to herself, and would sing to the amusement of those who were witness to her dulcet cones. All those crazy toilets, those automatic toilets, all those crazy toilets that push back up on you all the time, I say those automatic toilets, all those crazy toilets. I'll sell them to the five and dime. The questioning of the meaning of their work only deepened throughout the years. Who am I doing this for? What is the person that wants this done? And for the love of God, why? These are the thoughts that go through men's minds as they work, especially as they work in situations where their understandings are limited. Transistors hound wound and spun by the last of the analog artisan ladies out of Hong Kong, the chattering mimeography of micro machinery shimmering in his bones, body so between them, the whining and chirping and whirring, infusing his memories in the drone alchemy of endless melodies. He died, keeling over that mainframe, and his soul goes to the machine. It's up to his assistants to help him escape before the building is demolished. Upon the death of the man, the air was grave, though working with him for decades she felt his loss, and the loss of his presence deeply. There was an intuitive inclination in Pushyami, that despite the unexpected departure of Gideon from his earthly realm, she had not seen the last of him. He was in her thoughts when Henri came into her office to converse with her. I understand you must be having the trouble of a time, and I thought there was something that needed to be said in this moment. Pushyami paused. Her ears were listening, trying to hear anything of any significance he might have to say in this pivotal moment, the end of an era. She waited, ears agape. I just wanted to let you know that my middle name is Enrique. Pushyami looked at him straight in his strange eyes. She was confused by his statement and the innocence in how he made it. I will leave you to it. Then Pushyami recalled. In her moment of silence, all the wonderful times, and how much of a creature of habit she was. In fact, she fondly recalled walking by the terminal and the mainframe at 4.45 promptly each evening, and Mr. Goolsby, in a practical joke of his, had pre-programmed the terminal. He knew when she would be by, and he wanted her to always know by one word on the screen that he knew her habits. The one word he used was gotcha. She always chuckled to see as she completed her duties for the day when the terminal would greet her with a charming statement such as this. The day of the event was Sodom, and because of this she wept at the terminal, for she knew not how many days such unusual circumstances could continue. 
as she whipped at the terminal. The screen lit up not only with the familiar face, gotcha, but this time a communication, a signifier that he was still there. Enrique! How could it be, she wondered, that he would know this detail, that a strange, unusual man had never provided up until now? There must have been something unusual going on here. She mused, pacing about the terminal. Pacing about the terminal, she wrote, He's a prig! This dear Henri had a habit of occupying one conversation to an indeterminate and extended degree. At the time he would talk to you if some intrigue or notion took his fancy, he could, and did, go on for hours on end, of no nature of notions, nature, philosophy, world travel, cuisine, society, culture. He was one for unusual discoveries. It was often wondered by both Pushami and Gideon why these dis discussions were so persistent. She typed more into the terminal conversationally. The clicking of the keys as if hundreds of beetles were scurrying their way across cold tiles but the language was warm in conversation. She asked questions she was never able to ask the man alive, and inexplicably enough, this strange haunted terminal had answers for each one of her most pondered over inquiries. Each one of his responses had the ring of truth, and she knew when she had heard him that it was truly him within that machine. When she realized this, she realized there was only one thing that could be done. In the end, the soul of Gideon Goolsby was saved by his grave... Brave Girl Friday, Push Yammy Go Goretti, with an unintentional assistance by their boss, Henri Henry, who thought he was being frugal by relieving Push Yammy of her obligations, yet in so doing, liberated her with the skills, experience, and education she needed to save the day. In the nick of time, Push Yammy was able to transfer Gideon Goolsby's very soul into the ram chip that she found, and uh, this found its way to the auction clone. It was by holding the droning melodies of the machinery surrounding her, summoning her soul signal to the vessel for his escape. Push Yami had travelled a long way to recover from circumstance, the round ship which contained her former mentor, the man she had been proud to save from certain doom. In the end, Goolsby answers questions. He muses, he marvels at the cusp, at the outer perimeter of his life from beyond the edge, from beyond death, having cheated death. Push Yemi reveals her new one-of-a-kind prototype, a mobile computer with backwards compatibility to this vintage RAM chip, but a transitioner of somewhat mobile computer components. Most importantly is a good camera, microphone, processor, fine memory, and memories, and a sturdy motherboard built to last out of thick silicone. She calls it her goosey gotcha, and it is her companion on travels and adventures for her long, illustrious life. Miss Gogoretti's story was so inspirational, and her actions most heroic. To witness a contemporary peer in high dudgeon was quite breathtaking indeed. The time I saw her, she had tints of silver in her hair, luminous, almond, chestnut glow shining through her very presence. She had been in that magnificence for many years, and her presence was and is still awe-inspiring. To think back on it, it is wondered what other adventures she had had since, and it is destined that our paths will cross again, if only because of similar interests, familiar circles, drawn together by passionate inclinations. These and many stories, bound through time, will be explored globally, locally, throughout time. After the bidders get their new treasures secured and confirmed as theirs, we see various experts congregating around the new acquisitions, ready to apply their trade as required, to assist in potentially liberating the items from their plight. After hearing all these trials and travails, after hearing all these tales, I surmise the only appropriate was some foamy ales. A crowd at Gilton House was larger than other as we moved en masse from the auction house to the Pope. Those who had won their new treasures brandished them proudly, and you could tell that the night was young as all involved had giddy anticipation to see what would emerge from such dealings. Most likely I was to emerge from these locales after a nicer and due more in clothes, happily depending. I got the sense that the potentialities were broad and vague in their scope, and that almost anything might occur upon the culminations of today's events, and was eager to hear more from those who had made such portentous dealings, as were many assembled. The pool of Gildon House was unmistakable. Over the nights here it was clear to those travellers visiting they put some secret magic into each foamy point, and so the festivities for our final night of the conference were sure to persist into the late evening. People had a paranoia about them, it was almost optimistic in nature, and you could tell that the folks assembled were drawn out of irresistible curiosity. 
Of course, only those drawn to such ominous affinities would even assemble so. Still, there was a sense of no envy among those who did not win the bid, rather a curious sense of anticipation to see what events would unfold. There was an enthusiasm from the community, and those with the night before had their interest piqued. Seated Bosebrook and Emilio Campo Verding in attendance, their tales told and remembered fondly. Though I could tell their journeys and participation in the events unfolding would hold further promise and intrigue for all the days of their lives, though I knew that there were a dozen more that could share their stories tonight alone, I was sure the journey would be one unforgettable. And that concludes the final in all four trans server hall, the final of the three tales of Arthur Osborne's true tales of the supernatural. And if you like this content, please like and subscribe. Tell your friends. And we appreciate your, your viewing and your time. If you like this, please tune in for more. We appreciate you. And hopefully you have wonderful seasons ahead. Yes, indeed.